good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sheldon Goodwin. I am the Political Outreach Associate for Vermont Conservation Voters, and I'm going to be moderating the discussion this afternoon. Thank you so much for being here. This is the VCAN uh, workshop titled Building Back Better in Vermont, the New Climate Action Plan in a 2022 Legislative Look Forward. Um, and before we get started, a few housekeeping notes of please stay on mute unless um, we ask you to speak in the Q&A section. And probably the best way to view this panel is to view it in speaker mode versus gallery mode so that you can have a good view of the presenters as they are speaking. Um, so again, my name is Sheldon Goodwin, Political Outreach Associate for Vermont Conservation Voters. Vermont Conservation Voters, or VCV, works to elect environmentally friendly candidates to public office and then hold elected officials accountable for the decisions they make affecting our air, water, wildlife, land, communities, and health. And I'm really excited for our panel today. Um, climate action is a leading priority as we head into 2022, both in Washington and here in Vermont. As you probably know, President Biden just signed into law the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act which makes needed investments in electric vehicle charging stations and electric school buses, replacement for harmful lead water lines, clean technology, grid modernization, and so much more. Together with the, pack, this, the passage of this bill, um, as, as well as the American Rescue Plan Act and hopefully Build Back Better, we have a once in a generation opportunity to invest in climate action. And so this afternoon, we're going to hear from three different panelists. After we hear from the different speakers, there's gonna be time for Q&A. Um, so that you can ask all the panelists questions. Um, so our first speaker is Ben Edgerly Walsh. Um, ben is the Climate Energy and Program Director for VPIRG. He'll speak to what's in and what's not in the Climate Action Plan, as well as how folks can stay engaged in the process. Then we'll hear from Representative Sarah Copeland-Hanses from Bradford. She's a leader in the Legislative Climate Solutions Caucus and will speak to the Climate Solution Caucus's legislative priorities. And then we'll hear from um, Representative Becca White of Hartford. She's a leader on the House Transportation Committee. She will provide a deep dive on the transportation policy priorities and perspectives of the transportation innovation investments in 2022. And so as we get started, I will now hand it over to Ben. Thanks so much, Sheldon. Uh, again, uh, Ben Edgerly Walsh. I'm the Common Energy Program Director at VPIRG. Been working with Joey and the whole VCAN team for over a decade now. It's it's always a pleasure to be here at uh, VCAN. Though sadly, VCAN right now is in my house. Uh, I really wish I could be there with all of you. Always you know, deeply appreciate the opportunity to, to connect with you on a, a human level. Um, but in lieu of that, I'm really glad I'll be able to give you a little bit of context for. Um, what uh, has been going on on climate over the last uh, year in particular here in Vermont and what um, we expect um, going forward. But I really hope next year we can do this uh, in person um, and we get a chance to you know, talk a little bit less formally. So I'm gonna be covering, um, as Sheldon said, uh, the Climate Council, sort of what, what the work they did looked like and some of the big things in that plan. Um, I'm actually going to start uh, with a little bit of context for like how we got here, how we got to having a climate council in the first place. And I'm also going to touch on some of the other sort of big contextual pieces that are in the, the sort of the backdrop of how the legislature, what the legislature is going to need to be grappling with as they're approaching climate action this coming session. Um, <clears throat> so quickly, the sort of how we got here, I think is actually important to remind ourselves of. It feels like it's about 20 years since we first started talking about the Global Warming Solutions Act, but it's just been over two. Um, and really, you know, if, if I had to put sort of like one, a finger on like one moment, one day, when we really got to work on the Global Warming Solutions Act was the climate strikes in 2019, back in September of 2019. Do you remember that? We had thousands of people on the streets all around Vermont in small towns in our biggest cities, I was in Burlington. I think there were 3,000 people packed into the bottom block of Church Street um, listening to uh, Senate President Pro Tem Becca White, among others, talk about the deep need for climate action. And coming out of that, we went with a lot of momentum into the 2020 legislative session. We were pressing for the Global Warming Solutions Act. 
a number of other big climate actions. And ultimately, despite the pandemic crashing into the middle, middle of that legislative session, the Vermont public had made clear enough that it had been long enough that we had not sort of course corrected, had not gotten on track on climate action, that the Global Warming Solutions Act was able to pass the House, pass the Senate, and despite a gubernatorial veto, actually become law. And that is no small thing. That is something that happens incredibly rarely in Vermont. And it is worth remembering that that is how we got to actually having a climate council in the first place. Um, it really was Vermonters calling for climate action and saying enough is enough. We actually need to get serious about this now. So um, over the last year, the climate council that the Global Warming Solutions Act created has been hard at work uh, trying to figure out how we actually hit these legally required climate targets that we now have in Vermont statute in that law. And in particular, over the last several months, Joey and her 22 fellow council members and a whole host of uh, subcommittee members and staff have been just working incredibly hard to put together a climate plan that actually adds up to the pollution reduction requirements in Vermont law. Um, and then coming out of that, we're going into the 2022 legislative session and the rubber's really hitting the road. We're really going to start seeing whether you know, Vermont is actually serious about this. We actually are going to get on track to hit our goals or not. And that's, of course, what we're talking about today. So the, the Climate Plan and the Solutions Act and sort of what it requires, obviously, the, if you had to pick one central thing, and I don't think you should pick one central thing because there are a lot of really important parts of it. But if you had to, it would be the climate pollution reduction requirements in that law. So that's, if you're thinking about this as, you know, like perhaps a three-legged stool, that is one of those key components. It also is very clear that we need to do that while actually driving at equity, while allowing all Vermonters to be part of this transition and reducing inequity while, and because of our transition to climate action, and then making Vermont more, more resilient to the climate impacts that we know are coming. Um, there are also a lot of other key components I won't get into today around agricultural and eco ecosystems and ultimately Vermont, you know, sucking up more carbon into our farms and forests than we do today. There are a lot of really important, com important components in what is about a 300 page plan. So suffice it to say, if you want to know all the details, read it. I'm going to be pretty high level today. Um, so what is actually in there? I would say if you have to think about it sort of like at a very high level, there are a lot of really big important ideas that attempt to add up to the pollution reduction requirements in law. There are a lot of details to fill in. There are a lot of details to get right. This was never supposed to be a collection of a hundred fully written pieces of legislation that the legislature could then just like hand fully Bait to the governor, right? Like this was always going to be the council handing off the baton to the legislature. The legislature is going to get to work. They're going to send things to the governor, and then that is going to result in actual policies being implemented. And there will be more details to figure out there. This is always going to be a stepped process. So that's not a surprise. Um, the other thing that I just want to say up front, and I'll, I'll talk about transportation, you'll be hearing a lot more about that from Representative White in a few minutes, is you know, if you're asking the question, does this actually add up to the pollution reductions that are required in law? The answer is currently no, because shortly before the plan was adopted, two other states in New England pulled out of the Transportation and Climate Initiative, and that creates a hole in the programs that this, uh, this plan recommends. The plan still recommends the Transportation and Climate Initiative, but uh, that is not something that we're going to be able to join in the near term. Uh, somebody just shared their screen. Okay, we're back. <laughs> I don't know whose screen that was, but that was not me trying to show you my email. Um, so that's just important to know that there is more work to do. And let me just start there actually in the transportation sector in terms of the policies in this plan. It does recommend that as soon as TCI is actually viable, that this policy that would cap transportation pollution uh, regionally and 
and generate a lot of revenue for Vermont to invest in equitable tr transportation solutions, clean transportation solutions here in Vermont is something that we should pursue as soon as we can. Uh, it also recognizes that's not now, unfortunately. And so the council has committed, and this is actually in writing in the plan, to no later than June of this coming year, updating that section of the plan. That's something that Joey and many others are hard at work at um, already, despite the fact that this thing was adopted last week, they're already back at work. Um, and there will be more ideas on transportation to sort of plug that gap, absent TCI um, happening in the near term. Those you know, are a similar program called the Western Climate Initiative. That's something that California and Quebec and some others have uh, created and joined very similar kind of program to TCI. It's something that we potentially could join. There's also the idea of a clean transportation standard, basically saying to these oil uh, companies uh, that are selling gas and diesel, you have a responsibility to help people who are right now using your products move to cleaner options. Um, that's another thing that'll be explored. The other thing in transportation that I'll just touch on briefly is it definitely recognizes, the plan recognizes a need for TCI or no TCI, big investments in things like electric vehicles, electric vehicle charging, bike and walk infrastructure, dense development that allows more efficient you know, ways of getting from place to place public transit. Those are investments we're gonna to need to make no matter what the other policies we're putting forward are. The second policy I wanna to touch on is something called a clean heat standard. Folks are probably familiar with a renewable energy standard or a renewable portfolio standard. This is very similar, but instead of being for electricity, it's for heat. And essentially it's that similar idea to what I said a moment ago for a clean transportation standard. It just says to all of these big fossil fuel wholesalers that are selling fossil fuels into Vermont for heating, you now have a legal obligation to help Vermonters move from dirtier forms of heating to cleaner forms of heating. That could be cold climate heat pumps, it could be weatherization, it could be well vetted, very low greenhouse gas biofuels, but regardless, you have an obligation to actually help Vermonters make that transition. The third one that I wanted to touch on is weatherization at scale. The idea of getting roughly 100,000 more homes weatherized over the next decade. Um, that is something that is central, as everyone here knows, reducing energy use is a critical component uh, of actually transitioning to a low carbon economy. Obviously not sufficient by itself, but critical nonetheless. There's also a call for getting to 100% uh, renewable or zero greenhouse gas uh, electricity. That's one where there really are, there's an incredible lack of details in the plan, unfortunately, um, but ultimately we would love to see a move in that direction that actually significantly ramps up the requirements for new renewables, especially new renewables in Vermont. Um, and then the last uh, thing that I wanna mention in the legislative arena, last but certainly not least is an environmental justice policy. That's something that most states in this country have and Vermont does not, that is, far past time that we passed something like that. And there was a bill S-148 introduced in the Senate by Senator Keisha Rom Hinsdale last year that we'll be supporting going into this legislative session. Um, so there's a lot more details there. Obviously that was not 300 pages of content, but those are some of the top lines. I also wanna mention, and this is not a legislative item, but it's worth mentioning that the plan also uh, says that Vermont has to join uh, California, New York, and some other states in the advanced clean cars and advanced clean trucks rules, which basically say over the next decade and a half and for cars you know, and smaller trucks and several decades for medium and heavy duty trucks, we need to transition fully to zero emissions vehicles. That will get about 100,000 more electric vehicles in Vermont um, than we would have without that kind of requirement over the next decade. So it was really important. It's gonna go through rulemaking and does not need additional legislative authorization because we've been working with California on that kind of program for a couple of decades now. So this is just continuation of current policy. So I'm, a, I'm gonna wrap up in just a moment. I did just wanna mention uh, one other thing. 
that's going on in sort of state energy policy context, the comprehensive energy plan is being uh, written right now. There's a draft that's out. Uh, if you are interested in that, I encourage you to Google Vermont Comprehensive Energy Plan 2021. Take a look. They're ex accepting comments until December 20th. Um, that is something that we will be weighing in on, but is sort of subservient to the climate action plan. It's required to be consistent with the plan. So we've really been more focused on that plan in the legislative session. Um, the last couple of things I'll mention uh, are in the federal arena, the infrastructure bill, as Sheldon mentioned, passed uh, and was signed into law. That's going to bring a lot of dollars into Vermont, especially in the transportation arena. You'll be hearing more about that from Representative White. And then the Build Back Better uh, bill is something that we'll see. It's anybody's guess as to whether it will ultimately pass. We're certainly hoping that it will. That would probably be late this year or early next year if it does and will um, have quite a lot of incentives for the kinds of technologies that Americans need to be adopting, like all the things I've just been talking about, um, and will also have a significant impact on Vermont's budget. Now, I'm gonna shift and then I'll, I'll wrap in uh, about one minute and turn it over to Representative Sarah Copeland Hansis to really flesh out what I'm gonna get into, which is the next legislative session, right? That's where all of this flows. So when we're thinking about the next legislative session, the biggest, I mean, the, all of the things that I mentioned are probably going to land in the session, the clean heat standard and the renewable energy standard and weatherization and scale and the environmental justice bill and a whole host of other things coming out of the cap. And so we're gonna be hard at work and need your help in talking to your legislators, making clear that actually following through on the climate plan is so critical. If we don't do that, we are very, much saying we're not serious about climate action in Vermont. And then the second, the last big thing there is we have to make really significant investments. We have a historic opportunity to do that, especially with the federal dollars that are coming down in transportation and weatherization and clean heat across the board. So that's going to be about the transportation bill and it's going to be about the budget. And we need to make that case early and often that there are a lot of needs in Vermont. One of the critical needs that we need to focus on is the need to dramatically cut our carbon pollution and do that in a way that is equitable and allows all Vermonters to be part of this transition. So there's gonna be a lot of policies and there's gonna be a lot of money and we're gonna to have to do all of it together. And so we need all of you working with us to make all this happen. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, now I'm going to hand it over to Representative Sarah Copeland Hansis. Hi all, and uh, Ben, thank you for the the brief history lesson, so that we can all sort of review how how we got to this point. Um, uh, passing the Global Warming Solutions Act and putting our aspirations into statute as requirements um, seemed like a really big task. Um, until we started to see how the plan, uh, the, the council's plan was shaping up. And then, and then there was a sort of an aha moment where, um, where I said, wow, you know, this is going to be um, a GWSA scale pull every year from here on forward. Um, and so I'm really excited to see that we've got over 100 participants here today, um, Vermonters from all around the state. I see a few of my neighbors on the list as well. Um, and uh, folks who are really committed to helping us figure out how to do this uh, at the state level, at the local level, at the household and small business level. So um, thank you all for being here. Um, the leaders of the Climate Solutions Caucus are holding a, a, a town hall next uh, December 15th. And um, if Representative White doesn't beat me to it. I'll put a link to register for that event in the chat after I'm done talking, um, but would welcome you to come and hear a little bit more about the details of the bills that we're going to try to be moving and, and the strategy of how we're moving them. Um, and also on the 15th, there will be an opportunity for regional breakout groups. So you can meet with legislators from your region of the state and, uh, and do a little bit more Q&A. Uh, it is critically important for people who believe we need to make bold climate um, action in Vermont to stay in touch with their uh, representatives and find out what your legislators need in order to support them. 
Uh, we are moving a tremendously large uh, ship of our economy away from uh, the reliance on fossil fuels and towards uh, clean locally generated energy. Um, and there are a lot of um, well-funded uh, entities who would like to keep us from making that action possible. So it's gonna take all of you um, supporting all of us as we try to move legislatively on the things, uh, many of which uh, Ben just outlined for you. So thank you for being here today. Um, and thank you also for continuing to, uh, to have our backs. I'm, I'm just gonna run through a couple other um, uh, smaller things that Ben didn't mention that are unrelated to the transportation realm, which uh, Representative White will, will get into in a moment. Um, but there are a lot of potentials for us to, um, you know, to, to create pathways for Vermonters to transition their energy needs. And what an opportunity to do this at a time when we have uh, federal money coming in, when we have set aside money from last year's budget in order to help us meet our climate goals. It is just, you know, unfathomable that we could be looking at, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to help us uh, solve this and take our first steps towards um, true climate action and uh, and what a great opportunity we have in front of us. Um, so the state of Vermont has had a, an energy revolving fund for a while that helps um, state buildings uh, get weatherized and hopefully ultimately shift over to renewable energy sources for uh, the heating of our local, um, our, our state buildings all around the state. Uh, we would really love to be able to extend that SEMP program into our municipalities so that that revolving fund can be made accessible to municipalities so that we are, um, as government entities, uh, walking the walk. Um, and, uh, and so that's, uh, that's a little thing that you all should be looking at. Um, you also, many have uh, very close ties with, um, with your own municipal government and uh, can be helping your local folks think of ways that we can save money in our municipal buildings. Um, let's think for a moment about the concept of energy coaches, right? Um, we all recall, you know, a decade ago, um, you know, going to the local fair or a farmer's market and seeing Efficiency Vermont tabling with, uh, with efficient light bulbs and information about uh, saving energy in your home. We need to expand um, our offerings in terms of energy coaches to help Vermonters, and we need to expand it into that thermal sector as well. And, uh, you know, Vermonters will learn uh, from each other, um, but they will learn faster if, uh, if we're really pushing that out there with some folks who can help all the homeowners and business owners uh, figure out how they're going to uh, whether I uh, save money on their heating bills and also transition to renewable sources for heating. Um, we've got to move 100% renewable energy standard. That's something that we started at the same time that we started moving the Global Warming Solutions Act two years ago. And it was one of the things that that we lost capacity to do at that moment because of um, COVID response and all of the demands on our legislative time. Um, but we do need to come back to that. And then there's a couple other little things that have that are non-transportation related that have a really big impact in um, in reducing our uh, our climate pollution in the state. And that's around refrigerant management. Think about how many cafes, stores, school cafeterias, um, you know, grocery stores have uh, you know their refrigeration equipment. And you know, we all know that that those refrigerants are a major source of greenhouse gas uh, pollution. And uh, the more we can do to make it simple and easy for the little guys, you know, your general store down on the corner or the, you know, the, the coffee shop downtown that has a couple of coolers, the more we can make it easy for them to put in um, uh, refrigerant management systems, you know, a, uh, an alarm system that tells them when they're leaking and also help them transition to, uh, to less damaging refrigerants, um, the faster we're gonna solve this. And so uh, all of that to say, that's going to bring me back to a discussion about one of the bills that Ben talked about, and that is environmental justice, 
Okay. It's, I think it's uh, very important for us and, and should be one of the first things that we do this legislative session is to move a bill that establishes what we mean by environmental justice. And why did refrigerants bring me back to environmental justice? Because environmental justice needs to include not only um, racial justice and economic justice, but geographic justice. We need to make sure that the programs that are easily accessible by folks who live in the Chittenden County area or the more populous areas of our state are also available to the little stores and restaurants that are in Jay or Bradford or uh, Chester, okay? Uh, so we've gotta, we've gotta pass an environmental justice bill that really sets out the expectation of how we're gonna meet the needs of Vermonters wherever they are. Uh, and whoever they are. And so um, I thank you for tuning in. I'm going to pass this over to uh, Representative White, who's going to talk in more detail about some of the transportation stuff that we're going to be working on. But I look forward to seeing you on the 15th to talk a little bit more about our legislative priorities for the year. Thank you, Representative Copeland Hansis. Uh, and uh, I want to make a note, I did get to it to put in the chat, the link to register for that exact uh, Climate Solutions Caucus meeting with some help from Ben Edgerly Walsh, who had it teed up. Uh, and I feel like I've been very well teed up to talk about transportation. Um, I do want to note, uh, first of all, Ben, I am not the Senate pro tem. There is a fabulous Becca Ballant, uh, Senator Ballant, who is Senate pro tem. I have not been promoted just yet. <laughs> um, I knew I was thinking about that a second ago. I was like, I did that. Dude, I'm so sorry. Don't uh, worry. I, I will never be. <laughs> I will never be upset to be confused with another fabulous Becca. Um, and I also want to take a moment to thank everyone on the call who's on an energy committee or supports energy committees. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with many energy committees throughout the state, and I have a fabulous one in my district in Hartford. And I know that your work can be extremely challenging and at times defeating, <laughs> like you're running uphill. Uh, against, you know, a lot of wind coming your way or from all sides. So I really appreciate you taking the time um, to be with us today and for holding your communities accountable as we continue to look at energy um, transformation. So thank you for that. And I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully that'll work. Uh, and as I do that, one note of positivity if you don't know this, I actually met my husband at VCAN many years ago. So uh, that's just a little treat and a thank you to VCAN. <laughs> uh, so you should be seeing my screen and I'm going to scroll back to my first slide uh, because I'm going to be talking to you briefly about something called the Transportation Innovation Act. Uh, and this is a piece of legislation that is modeled off a strategy that the transportation committee kind of climate champions worked on last year. Uh, and that's to get ahead of the T bill or the transportation bill, which is the large budget bill that every year the administration brings to us in the transportation committee. So in the past, the T bill would come to the transportation committee in the house and the Senate, and we'd be kind of nibbling at the edges of what policies we want to change. And unfortunately that puts us on our heels when we're trying to create uh, progressive policies, especially in the climate arena. So to respond to that, uh, the chair, Representative Kurt McCormick from the previous session, uh, worked on this strategy with us uh, for the transportation modernization bill. Uh, this year we're changing the lingo and it's the Transportation Innovation Act. So if you're familiar with H94 previously, this is the revamped and improved strategy uh, going off of that. So before I get to the priorities of the bill, I'm gonna switch it around a little bit because we've already highlighted uh, with the previous speakers, uh, some points that I wanna make really clear, uh, which is that there are immense funding opportunities coming our way for Vermont to respond and use federal dollars uh, to advance our climate goals. Uh, talking billions, of, like a, over a billion dollars um, when it comes to transportation funding coming our way. Uh, 
with that said, we've already talked about how TCI is not in the picture. Uh, and if you're not already aware, you might kind of understand that the gas tax revenue, which is foundational to the funding of our state transportation dollars is also going down. So a key thing I wanna highlight for this group is we're gonna need your advocacy as we look at the kind of non-intuitive moment in time where we have lots of federal funding, but potentially a lot less state dollars to meet the match to take advantage of all that federal funding. So it's a very strange point in time when you might be hearing we've got cash on hand, we can shovel worthy projects up the wazoo, but we actually don't necessarily have the amount of state dollars we need to meet the match to do all the fabulous work that we potentially could do. So I wanna highlight that. Uh, and I also wanna note that uh, we were able to accomplish quite a bit in the previous session working hand in hand with the administration. If you're familiar with the electric vehicle incentive program uh, and expansion of level three, those fast chargers for electric vehicles, that kind of work is happening already uh, along with a multifamily electric vehicle charging program. So you might be familiar with some of the concepts that we're building on in this bill. And then this other point here, I just wanted to note again that the transportation bill is what will become the vehicle for the language I'm gonna talk about in a minute in the Transportation Innovation Act. So when you talk to your fabulous representatives, I see another one on here, Representative Scott Campbell. If you're in St. Johnsbury and you're talking to Scott about this bill, he's gonna be ideally supporting the Transportation Innovation Act, but also knowing that the T, fingers crossed, um, the T bill uh, will be what's moving. <laughs> uh, so what actually is in the bill? Uh, so there's four key components. Uh, the first is a transition to zero emission vehicles. Uh, and we're doing that by continuing funding or advocating for continued funding. Um, and I can zoom in if this is like a, a total eye chart for folks too. Um, let's see if I got a little closer. There we go. And if that's terrible, I can also ask that we share this afterwards. Uh, so again, oh, thank you, Sheldon. <laughs> Uh, so we've got that EV incentive program continuing to be funded. Those are the incentives on top of potential federal money uh, in a tax credit. Uh, we've also got creation of an EVSE, which is electric vehicle supply equipment. That's your chargers. We have uh, created a rebate program uh, modeled off of the Nevada program and shout out uh, to Liam at BPIRG for helping us identify that program. Uh, the rebate program would give access to businesses, schools, and municipalities to install level two chargers. Uh, the idea being that we're hearing from our municipalities, schools, and small businesses that they wanna have a charger at their location, but the upfront cost is difficult. So we wanna draw down some of that federal funding and also create a program that gives more of an equal access across the state. So look out for more on that, please advocate for that. Uh, Representative Copeland Hanses stressed this um, next piece, which is equity. Uh, within transportation, equity is key. When we talk about electric vehicles as like the one solution, I'm always a little bit drawn away from that because equity, when we think about it, is public transportation. It's having a non-vehicle solution to getting where you need to go because the cost of a vehicle is oftentimes a determinant of if you can access like a good paying job or uh, a quality of medical care if you need to drive. So there's lots of solutions when we think about transportation equity outside of what I have listed here that is meant to help folks who don't have access to a vehicle. But under this, um, I've highlighted three programs that we're continuing to fund, Mileage Smart, uh, Replace Your Ride, and the Electric Bike Rebates. So that's a bit of a passion project for Representative Molly Burke, if you know anything about electric bikes. Uh, and the Mileage Smart program, I think, is exactly what this state needs to continue to work on because it's helping Vermonters who are in those high gas guzzling vehicles switching over to efficient or all electric vehicles, um, helping our most vulnerable Vermonters get access to the transition we have to clean energy and clean fuel. So highly recommend learning about that program. Next, uh, innovation with two eyes. 
uh, and efficiency. Uh, we are also trying to navigate how as a state we move away from that one car, one person, single trip uh, use that we are all, we all do. Uh, and to do that, we're continuing funding of the Mobility and Transportation Innovation Grant Program. That's a program also known as like the MTI grant program uh, that was giving uh, money and uh, support to nonprofits, towns, public transit providers to do innovative activities uh, to advance efficiency and transportation innovation strategies. Uh, my favorite one to highlight in what I think would work exceptionally well in that rural um, setting is uh, Ruber or rural Uber, <laughs> um, also known as not fixed route public transportation. So imagine instead of having, and, and if you don't know what Uber is, come find me. I'm happy to give a little explanation. We had two Uber drivers in the upper valley um, as of late, uh, but it's, it's giving folks an access to a low cost. You don't need to stand at a bus stop and wait for the route that you want to get to that appointment. Instead, it's on-demand access to uh, transportation, um, ideally in like a carpool setting. Uh, the other uh, piece to this uh, is transportation demand management, which is trying to respond in the past or uh, in other parts of the country, uh, it's meant to respond to congestion, like high traffic. For Vermont, it's more trying to understand how if we've got one place that everyone is going to, how do we maximize the fewest single car trips to that location? That could be a large employer, uh, a community hub, a downtown. How do we use strategies to get folks out of that one car, uh, one person trip and into alternatives since we're all going to the same place at relatively the same time? Uh, and then last but certainly not least, uh, it's bike and pedestrians. Uh, when we look at Vermont's infrastructure, it's not built to accommodate or wasn't designed to accommodate uh, walking and biking as the primary mode of travel. We have to change that. Vermonters my age, I'm 27, we want to walk. <laughs> we want to take our bikes or walk to downtown. We don't want to get in a car. And that means establishing uh, parameters for complete streets, uh, which if you're not familiar with that program, I can dive in. But um, what what you need to know about complete streets is it, uh, it, it is a set of priorities for bike and pedestrian infrastructure building. But there are some ways that you can get out of meeting complete streets requirements for, let's say, cost or um, other barriers. And what we found is when any kind of barrier is present for building bike or pedestrian, folks will take that and not actually meet the requirements of complete streets. So trying to lower those. Uh, and then uh, I also wanna highlight Representative um, Carrie Dolan put out a bill for a pedestrian safety pilot. We will be um, putting that into the bill as well. Um, and it, it's scary to think um, if you've read any uh, recent articles uh, about uh, when a car and a person interact, um, when you have a crash like that, the pedestrian is at the highest risk, obviously, um, and we're building cars to protect people inside the cars and not people outside the cars. So what's scary is to look at how pedestrian deaths are rising while in-car deaths are decreasing. Um, so I'm hoping that this can also be a strategy to employ that. So uh, in conclusion, I just want to shout out uh, to the lead sponsors on this bill. Uh, if you recognize any of these faces uh, and you are in their districts, please thank them. Um, these are all members of the Transportation Committee. I don't have Representative Diane Lamfer, who's the chair on here. That's not to say that she is unsupportive of this bill, but she's doing the right thing and being objective when it comes to our table. Uh, but we do know she's also a climate champion and has worked closely with us on this and previous legislation. So uh, we'll be seeking ideally over 70 co-sponsors for this bill. So if you've got a representative who's not on this page, uh, also note to them, if you run into them, that the Transportation Innovation Act is something they should prioritize. Uh, so that's it for me. Um, and I'll stop sharing my screen. Thanks so much, Becca. Um, so now we're going to have time for a Q&A. And we have about 20, uh, 25 minutes for a Q&A. 
Um, and looking through the chat, I think a question that seems to be coming up a lot is, uh, particularly maybe for you, Ben, about like what folks can do now that the Climate Action Plan has passed, how do folks stay engaged in the process, and um, what are the kind of the next steps for public engagement from the Climate Council's point of view? So I think uh, Joey unfortunately had to feel that she'd probably be the very best position to answer that. Um, I, my understanding is that that's something that the council is still uh, working to develop what their public engagement process looks like over the next several months. Um, they have definitely been talking about doing, uh, be, getting feedback on the plan as it is an initial plan and they do uh, plan to update at least sections of it. Um, but exactly what that looks like is uh, a little bit unclear at this point. Um, they also are going to be working in a little bit more detail on certain parts of it, like um, the funding and financing aspects, you know, how, how should federal money be used? Uh, what are the sort of critical things that we're investing in and what levels do we need to invest in? I know they're going to be talking about that in the coming month um, as in the lead up to the legislative session. And as I mentioned, there's going to be a more detailed push around transportation to add some components to the climate plan or flesh them out more, flesh out things that are already in there, um, then actually have an updated uh, plan adopted prior to June. Um, so I guess my advice would be, uh, you know, check your email if you're on VPERGs or VCANs or VNRCs or VCVs list. We'll certainly be in touch as we have more details and like when and where you can engage going forward. Um, you can also check out climatechange.vermont.gov um, and they have a good sort of calendar of council meetings that are coming up um, and, you know, keep that relatively well updated in terms of when and where people can, um, can engage. Uh, the, the other thing that I'd say is just to reiterate, uh, certainly it will be important to keep, keep on engaging at the Climate Council going forward. There's a real acknowledgement at the Council that they, you know, tried hard in the, uh, the time frame that they had to uh, really engage the public. They did have many hundreds of people actually weigh in, but especially um, with communities that, you know, often have a harder time uh, engaging in these kinds of public processes. Uh, lower income Vermonters, Vermonters uh, who don't speak English as their first language, there is more need to engage them in the actual, like, what do you think about this plan and, and how we're moving forward? So there's going to be more there. But the other really, really, really important thing is making sure that we actually get the legislative component of this right. Um, so obviously, there are some real champions for climate action uh, on here today on the panel and, and attendance as well as Rep Representative White mentioned. Um, but whoever your representative is, Democrat, Republican, progressive, independent, um, senators, state senators as well, reach out to them, let them know you're looking at the climate plan, you're really excited about big climate action this session and you expect them to support it. Um, that is the number one thing that we can do to make sure that this plan is, is actually worth the massive amount of time that was put into it and we really make it a successful plan as, as it's implemented. Okay, and this is a question for Representative White um, or anyone else who wants to weigh in. What do you think are some of the barriers to increasing EV charging within the state? And what are some of the ways that we can um, increase EV charging stations? That's a fabulous question. And I actually, I'm trying to copy and paste all the great questions that are in here um, in case we don't get to them. Uh, for EV charging, I think the barrier that I hear the most is cost uh, and difficulty in understanding what charger to put in, what's, what's gonna be the charger for now, what's gonna be the charger in five years, do I do Tesla, do I do charge point, do I do EV go? So it's a combination of cost and just complication with any new adoption of um, kind of any, any equipment. 
Uh, so, oh, and then a third challenge I would say for the level three, those really fast chargers is finding a location that works with uh, the demand on electricity needed for that charger. So you don't see a level three on a back road and that's because those lines, as I'm sure all of our energy committees know, don't have the juice um, to actually properly charge um, a level three. So to remove those barriers, uh, the rebate program that we're hoping to establish, I think is a great first step. Uh, the second thing that I'm hoping we can work on this session and is not gonna be one and done this year uh, is uh, continuing to provide information for businesses, schools, municipalities, and what they can do when it comes to charging. Is it, uh, and I think about that with their fleets mainly. Do they offer a program to their employees to have electric vehicle charging at their home? Do they offer a program to have workplace charging? Give them some guidelines on which charger now. Um, and if you as a municipal, if you're a part of your energy committee and you're saying, hey, I'm, we're interested in this. We want a charger at our town hall or at our school. I'd say the first step uh, is to understand um, what kind of charger you want. Uh, and then reach out uh, to see if there are um, like charge point or any of those programs coming to in the near future, like your utility, for example, Green Mount Power, Vermont Electric, all of those places are already starting to um, work with different organizations to put in chargers. So uh, there's a few barriers, but uh, a lot of solutions, both legislatively and in the private sector. Can I just touch on that briefly as sure. well? Um, so uh, we, this is something that uh, BPR spent a fair bit of time looking into. Um, in particular, how do you do this equitably? How do you make sure that, this, uh, that electric vehicles are really something that's accessible to all Vermonters? Um, and there are some sort of particular demographics of Vermonters that are gonna have much harder time uh, transitioning to electric transportation. And as a result, you know, if, if we don't change that dynamic, are gonna get stuck Sort of holding the bag as it were still paying high costs for gasoline 10 years from now and a lot of other people have shifted to more affordable electric vehicles um and so there there's no sort of silver bullet on that but there are a few things that are really critical one is for renters who actually can't install a home charger we really need to invest in multifamily charging um sorry multi-unit dwelling charging or you know charging at rentals um so uh, we're certainly hopeful and, and you know representative white has touched on this that that's something that uh, the state will invest quite a lot more in. Um, and then uh, similarly, work, uh, charging at workplaces is really important because you're not gonna be able to have you know, chargers at or outside of every multi-unit dwelling in the state. And so pairing that with being able to charge the other place you're parking for big chunks of time, which is where you're working for eight or 10 hours a day um, is a, a, you know, a really good complement uh, in terms of actually you know, dealing with the, the equity considerations. Um, and I'd say you know, it, it's gotta be a mix of level two and level three, like there are different use cases um, and we gotta invest a lot in both of those speeds. Awesome, thanks so much. Um, and another question um, was about climate resilience and related to soil health and stormwater management and the ways that the climate action plan potentially speaks to climate resilience. Can I jump in on that one? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, I, I won't say that I have a, the complete answer to, to that. Those are really good points. Um, I think one of the challenges that we have right now in looking at this 270 something page uh, climate plan is that there, there are a number of things that, you know, that we're already doing and we know how to simply ramp up and do more of. And then there are a whole um, set of activities that we, um, that fall into the category of, we know this is good for our emissions uh, and good for um, uh, our, our water quality and soil health. We know that they're all sort of aligned with our climate goals but we don't yet know how to measure necessarily all of the different um, aspects of, um, of uh, trying to incentivize uh, some of these activities around good soil health and agricultural management. And, 
And um, I, I think we're, uh, I personally am committed to continuing to do this work and to, um, to look for ways to incentivize the things that are good for our soil health and that will um, simultaneously be, uh, be good for the climate as well. Um, but we've got to figure out how we measure that and how we quantify it. And then, um, you know, I think most responsibly, we need to look at what, what is the biggest bang for our buck or what are, what's the investment that gives us the most tons of greenhouse gas emission reduction per dollar spent. And um, we don't yet know where, where some of these um, uh, soil and land use uh, practices fit into that ranking of, you know, ton per dollar. Um, and we'll keep working on it. Sheldon, if I could jump in on that one. For resiliency, I also think, and I know I'm like the transportation person today, but I think about culvert size uh, and, quality of roads, bridges, all of that really matters when we talk about resiliency. So when I look at the, you know, the chart of how much, how much, mil how many millions of dollars we have coming for infrastructure improvements, it's also prioritizing not just the hundred year flood, but the greater floods and the greater consistency of hundred year floods. Um, thank you. Thank you. Our next question is, um, would you be able to flesh out how the Climate Action Plan addresses equity in a bit more detail? Sure, I, I can touch on that and maybe your legislators can say how they're thinking about approaching it this session. Um, so there, uh, there was a whole Just Transitions uh, subcommittee of the council um, that I'd encourage you to you know, take a look at their work. There um, is quite a lot of detail in there in terms of uh, the sort of principles of a just transition and the rubric around, uh, you know, how we need to be, what we need to be looking at when we're designing any program or on climate, or, you know, frankly, they would, they would apply to most other areas as well. Um, so that's something that the, the council started to be able to go through, um, unfortunately didn't have the time to really get all the way through that process. Um, and I'm sure we'll continue to work on that. But it's something that uh, I think will be a useful tool for the legislature as they're approaching it as well. There are also some um, important components in there that sort of didn't, there's a section of the climate plan called cross-cutting recommendations. That's where the environmental justice uh, bill falls. These are things that sort of didn't fall neatly into one of the buckets. It's like, it's not just transportation, it's not just heating. They kind of uh, are overarching components. Um, and one thing that one recommendation that's made in there, for instance, is a need to make sure that we're investing in translation and language access and community outreach, because if we're you know, creating all these wonderful programs, all these wonderful incentives, even if they're incentives that are designed to be you know, targeted to low income Vermonters, for instance, if we're not actually doing the work to get out in communities, speak to people sometimes literally in their own language, as in not English, um, and, and tell them, you know, what the opportunities they have are, then we're not actually gonna be able to deliver these programs equitably. So that's something that the, the council made clear. Um, and then they also, the last thing I'll mention is on public engagement. I mentioned this briefly before, they feel like they tried hard, but didn't actually nail uh, by any stretch the, the ways in which we need to engage the public, especially marginalized communities um, as we're sort of standing these kinds of programs up. And so our hope would be that in the legislative process and then certainly in the sort of program creation and implementation process that there would be a really robust public engagement, um, you know, that goes beyond like, here's a Zoom meeting and we'll see what, you know, the 10 people who show up say, um, that really is about community outreach and um, equitable access as well. Awesome, thank you. Um... So we have another transportation related question. Um, could you speak a little bit more to what transportation demand management is and what are the most accessible strategies um, for that, especially in rural areas? Thanks, I'm happy to field that one. Uh, so transportation demand management or TDM is a suite of uh, policy uh, suggestions and standards uh, that is, it's kind of like a terminology for 
like a whole bunch of different things. So um, TDM was something that I looked into my first year in the legislature because I was trying to understand when you have a large employer and everyone's going to one location, how do you maximize um, having fewer trips in single car, um, single person ways? Uh, so some of the strategies that TDM recommends uh, is, is carpooling, number one. So if you're familiar with Go Vermont, that's like the best TDM strategy we have in the state. Uh, it's also helping employees afford or transition to public transportation uh, rather than uh, using a vehicle. Um, it's uh, promoting uh, flexible work. And it's funny because TDM, <laughs> my first year, <clears throat> I was like, we have to talk about work from home and not driving to the office every day or taking two days on and three days off. And everyone's like, no one's going to do that. That's a terrible idea. And so it's very funny to me to talk about TDM now because we're actually kind of doing the best TDM strategy we possibly could um, with our unfortunate need to respond to COVID-19. Uh, so flexible work schedules and working from home is probably the best uh, TDM strategy we can employ for rural Vermont. And that comes with the key point about how broadband needs to fit into this strategy, because you cannot work from home in rural Vermont. And I bet as my internet is freezing up as I'm saying this, um, <laughs> and actually uh, not travel to work unless you have good broadband and good internet. And I'm happy to send there's some really good resources on TDM if you're thinking about it for your municipal strategy or as a business and my internet did freeze <laughs> oh great <laughs> thank you um our next question is how can we expand the role of energy committees um, in terms of building new ones, as well as expanding the role they have in um, kind of climate action going forward. Would you be able to speak to that, Becca, as a former yeah. energy Yeah, I'm happy. Yeah, I was like, oh, who's going to jump on it? Because um, I know that <laughs> Uh, Representative Copeland Hansis and Ben have both worked closely with energy committees in their communities and through their jobs. Um, for me, I uh, had the joy of being an energy committee member, albeit briefly, um, in Hartford, and then also serving on the select board as the liaison to my energy committee. So when I think about your role um, and how you can expand it, the thing that comes to my mind first is that deep dive, which many of you have already done, into what your municipality is doing when it comes to energy and considering um, looking at getting an energy coordinator like what Hartford did or working uh, like with Two Rivers, um, uh, our regional planning commission and having a regional energy coordinator. And I know that that's me asking volunteers to ask for a paid position and that can be difficult it's actually extremely important to have someone on the inside um, when it comes to these conversations. Um, I think as probably all of you know, when you're going to your select board or city council, having either a champion who's a department head or an energy coordinator makes all the difference. Um, so I would, I would suggest advocating for those positions. When you're thinking about policy work and how you can make your voice heard under the Golden Dome, uh, it's working with um, VNRC, it's working with VCAN, um, and it's showing up and holding your representatives accountable. Uh, one of the most powerful things that happens for me, um, and it did happen while we were over Zoom, is when I get a note from an individual call, uh, like an individual person while we're discussing a bill or when I'm in committee, that one person can make a huge difference. So be a resource to your representative to advocate for the positions that you want take them to coffee, have a Zoom meeting with them, invite them to your energy committee meeting, tell them what you're up to. You'll have such a better relationship if you start that conversation before the session. And also keep an eye and feel comfortable calling your representative, sending them an email. Um, if you're like some of my constituents, a Facebook message or kind of an elbow in the co-op. All of that helps. Um, and then working with uh, like the leadership work that I know um, uh, the Energy Committee Chair Linda Gray in Norwich is doing. If you want to be on that advocacy edge 
reach out to the folks who are your advocates, like the VNRC group, like VCAN, um, or Sierra Club, they're great, uh, VPIRG, all of that matters um, and makes a big difference, even if it's just one person, one phone call at the right time. I will just note two other quick things on that. Um, one, to the paid coordinator's point, absolutely agree. I will say that the, the legislature provided a number of our, our organizations um, advocated for this and, and the legislature followed through some funding for the regional planning commissions to actually uh, create those kinds of positions. It's not literally like every RPC has one now, um, but that capacity, it, you know, we are trying to build up that capacity recognizing that many towns are just too small to have a full-time staffer to do that specific job. Um, and the RPCs are sort of a logical place for that capacity to live for the smaller towns who still could really benefit from that kind of work being done by a paid staffer. Um, so worth probably talking to your RPC about that and sort of seeing what capacity is already available and you might be able to tap into some of that capacity even if you can't fund it locally. The other thing, and I think this did come up in a chat as well, um, but uh, it's worth noting that there are a lot of federal dollars for municipalities right now. That's not something that Beaver has been tracking terribly closely, so I can't really speak to it. Um, you know, we work primarily at the state level and the, in the state house in Montpelier, but um, engage at your local, you know, select board or city council and understand where that conversation is at. Certainly there's a, a lot of potential there to make investments uh, in this arena, um, you know, making municipal buildings more efficient and all the rest. Um, we're hoping to do, as Representative Copeland hands us mentioned, more on that in the legislative session, but there's no reason to, to wait. Yeah, and also I'll just add as someone who's engaged, I'm at the local level here in Winooski, I know our like volunteer finance commission is thinking about ARPA dollars and how to make recommendations to the city council. So I feel like now is definitely the time to get engaged with your local city council or select board about investments. Um, and Sheldon, do you mind if I, I sorry to interrupt. I did want to yeah. make one thing clear that I didn't say before. You yourself should be running for office. If you haven't, if you're an energy committee and you are looking around and your legislator is not representing that point, run for office, run for select board, run for state representative, run for state senator. It really does matter. I second that point from <laughs> Representative Bright. Um, kind of a similar related question. Um, is there a need for increased capacity in state government to kind of implement all of these plans and ideas that we are putting forth? Um, and what is kind of the way that we can go about advocating for that increased capacity? And that is an excellent question and one that I'd love to dive into. And I would guess that Ben and Becca both have thoughts on this as well. Um, it, we have a tremendous challenge ahead of us <coughs> in, um, in being able to achieve our climate goals and in being able to maximize the effectiveness of the money that we have uh, right now in front of us. And um, we are looking at agencies of state government that, um, that for the entire six years of this current uh, Scott administration haven't seen an increase in their, <coughs> in their fees because the governor has not put forward a, a bill to take a look at whether the fees that are collected are adequately covering the services that, uh, that, that state government needs to provide us. And that is creating a tremendous amount of pressure within our um, state agencies. And in many cases, it has required them to leave positions open rather than filling them so that they can see the vacancy savings on that. This is all sort of in the weeds, uh, you know, workings of state government. Um, but but it, I say it to remind you all that <laughs> that you know, elections do matter. And this administration has not been um, proactive about jumping on the climate crisis. They've talked the talk, but they haven't walked the walk, um, including but not limited to vetoing the Global Warming Solutions Act. Uh, but if you all read the dissension letter that uh, was put out by some of the administration members on the Climate Council, you'll see that that dissension is still there. So how do we reach that capacity? I think it's gonna require um, 
the legislature uh, looking at creating um, some sort of um, climate czar uh, or head of climate action within uh, within state government and where that position sits really kind of depends on um, on on uh, how much collaboration we can get with this administration on creating that position. But we've got, you know, we've got so much opportunity and um, we really don't want to squander that by not being forward thinking and, uh, and focused on how to implement some of these recommendations in the climate plan uh, and spend the, the dollars that we have going forward. And I'll just jump in here to say that to Representative Copeland Hans's point, exact thing on the transportation side, where we don't believe we have the staff need properly implement the programs that we're asking. So in uh, additional full-time staff members for AOT, uh, and we're also uh, going to be asking directly um, to loop in another question I'm seeing in the chat about the implementation of the multifamily electric vehicle program. Uh, I seem to have frozen. So if you can hear me I, and not see me, I apologize. Um, but that program uh, has been... Um, on it, it started, but we weren't seeing the staff ability to actually implement that multifamily electric vehicle charging program. Uh, so we'll continue to advocate for that. And what you're likely to hear from the administration is the suggestion of limited service positions. Uh, and that's to use the federal funds that are coming their way, but that's not full-time staff. So I think that's the debate we're gonna have, um, at least in the transportation world. Um, and I'll underscore that, um, leaving the positions vacant um, throughout the administration is a strategy they've used. They also are struggling like with snowplow drivers to just get people in. So um, there's a mixture of, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop talking and plug and unplug and plug in my router. Okay, <laughs> we have time for a couple more questions. Um, but one is about local renewable energy um, and the ways that the Climate Action Plan speaks to the need for local energy production, um, as well as any legislative strategies to increase local renewable energy. You can take a crack at that. Um, and on the work on the, the state government capacities, um, I'll just uh, drop a link to the full climate plan in here. Um, there is a short but uh, meaningful uh, recommendation on that page 247 of the PDF. Um, the, the numbers don't line up, 247 of the PDF. Take a look at that. Um, it's something that all of our groups were pressing for as well. Um, and you can find a, a letter to the council that, that says that among many other things um, on our website, or several of our websites, I think. Um, on local renewable energy, that, that's absolutely right. I, I've said, seen several comments in there. Um, that really you know, hit the nail on the head. The climate plan and the draft comprehensive energy plan for that matter really fail to acknowledge the need for, you know, to build a lot more new renewable energy than what we already have in the ground, including here in Vermont. <clears throat> um, as I, I mentioned very briefly in my overview, there is a, a recommendation to get to 100% renewable or carbon-free uh, power going forward, but it, it basically says, and here are a lot of different options for how to do that, it, but it doesn't make any recommendations as to what that path should be. And from you know where I'm sitting, if we have a state energy policy that gets us to quote unquote hundred percent, but doesn't get any new renewable energy bill, that's not a policy worth having. We're not gonna reduce global carbon pollution if we're not building new renewable energy and Vermont's got a responsibility to be part of that picture. Um, so, it's something that plan, that's definitely a gap in the plan, and uh, you know we would push, will push, in the legislature to have an update to Vermont's renewable energy standard that requires a lot more new renewable energy, and it's very clear that a lot of that renewable energy is going to need to get built right here in Vermont because it's going to be here or it's going to be somewhere else, and there's no reason that we shouldn't be building it 
right here we have the workforce we have the uh we have the companies we have the expertise and we have the moral responsibility to not make this somebody else's problem Awesome. Um, so our last question kind of goes back to the idea of environmental justice and equity. How do we make sure that the small towns don't get left behind as we are uh, working to um, give out money and think about how we implement the climate action plan? Um, that's an excellent question and one that sort of intersects with my uh, role as chair of house government operations, uh, because a lot of what we do is uh, is around uh, looking at how our municipal level governments can um, can do better. Um, and I think one of the one of the important things for folks to understand is that um, Vermont communities can now enter into intermunicipal agreements. Um, in order to share resources. So maybe you have a neighboring town um, who doesn't quite have enough um, need or enough money to, uh, to create a, an energy coordinator position, uh, but maybe you can share across uh, community lines. Um, regional planning commissions are also um, valuable partners in this space and in many cases are helping communities to, um, to, to find and, and access uh, some of this technical expertise um, across communities. Uh, so I would definitely reach out to your own RPC and, and uh, find out if they are able to offer help. Um, and I guess I would just put a plug to all of the folks who are on this meeting today that if you have ideas and you're coming up against roadblocks that we can eliminate for you, um, you know, any statutory roadblocks with, uh, with finding ways to share resources across community lines, please let me know because I would love to be able to, uh, to help eliminate those uh, barriers because um, equity really does need to include um, all of the small towns and villages in Vermont being able to access um, these same kinds of programs. And so we are looking to be creative in helping you uh, solve these uh, challenges. Thank you. Um, so I just want to thank all of you for being here, for participating in this discussion. I want to thank our panelists as well for taking the time to be here. Um, as we close, I just want to encourage you all to stay engaged in this process, to stay as engaged and increase your engagement on climate action. Um, we really do need all of your support and local communities really getting involved in order for this to really to happen. Um, so I just want to thank everyone for being here. And that's the conclusion of our panel.